walk for me no more, no more. The good things come and then they go. And I thought that was particularly propitious at this time. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, last year, we had planned all over the country to celebrate in great, great uh, uh, exultation the passage of the 1965 Civil Rights Bill, a Voting Rights Act, mm -hmm. which gave the blacks for the first time uh, unimpeded access uh, to the franchise. Yes. But in 19, I mean in 2014, the Supreme Court repeated itself as it had at the end of Reconstruction and simply gutted the bill. The idea was, as Justice Roberts said, since we don't have any more discrimination in voting, we don't need that bill. Mm -hmm. Clarence Thomas wanted to throw out the whole bill, he said, because he thought it was so unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And what they did was to take out the enforcement parts of, of the bill because it, uh, <clears throat> because the the bill did say that uh, uh, Congress had the right to enforce uh, the Voting Rights Act, and it also said that any changes in state laws had to be approved by the Civil Rights Commission before they could proceed. The Supreme Court ruled that that part was unconstitutional, and. Uh, did away with it, and the next day, North Carolina and so many of the other southern states instantly passed laws making it difficult for blacks to vote, and I expect if things stay as they will, within the next 30 to 40 years, uh, it will be impossible to vote because of new things they can come up with. Mm -hmm. um, my disappointment, though, is not so much that the Supreme Court uh, issued that decision, my problem with it is I'm just simply not sure that the Supreme Court has that authority. Mm -hmm. And I think it usurped authority as it has been doing since 2000 when it awarded the presidency to uh, appointees of, uh, uh, to, 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 to George Bush, many of whom had been appointed by George Bush the first. Mm -hmm. So George Bush II won it through a tremendous power grab of the court. And it seems that the court is continuing all of these power grabs, uh, gutting the uh, Affordable Health Care Act so that it was designed for 50 states, but 19 states, uh, many of whom are in the, many of which are in the Deep South, do not have to comply with it. So whereas there should be 50 million people involved in the Affordable Health Care Act, there are 20 million people. Mm -hmm. The court has also come up with the idea of nullification of federal law and executive orders, which means that, uh, and we thought nullification was really taken care of by Andrew Jackson, mm -hmm. but now, of course, if, if, if attorneys general or Republican parties in various states don't like the laws, they simply nullify them by going around the executive and the Congress to the Supreme Court. I'm equally bothered, most of all, by our passive acceptance of this. Mm. And I look for, I, I know that uh, uh, Elijah Cummings made a statement about the impact of destruction of the Voting Rights Act, but what about the other point? Mm. I heard nothing from Cory Booker, nothing from Senator Scott, and President Obama simply said, um, well, I, I'm disappointed in the decision. Well, the Voting Rights Act is why he was president. <laughs> and so therefore, it's uh, amazing that he would take that position, though normally I don't criticize him for anything other than prolongation of the war. But I think that in this case, it would have been very appropriate for him to function just like President Trump has functioned. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, his displeasure about what is going on with the, with the Supreme Court. I say this because 
The 15th Amendment is absolute. It says states cannot pass laws to keep blacks from voting. And of course, the Supreme Court ruled that, and it said the, the federal government should have the, the right to enforce this, or Congress should have the, the right to enforce this. And the Supreme Court ruled, well, Congress doesn't have the right to enforce it. So you had the Voting Rights Act nullified, and to a great extent, the 15th Amendment nullified. Mm -hmm. So we will have to sit up and see what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, many of us are concerned presently over the fact that uh, it seems that the uh, Republican Party which is headed by its southern state representatives, is going after everything. Uh, Obamacare, uh, EPA regulations, and uh, now I understand they're going to go after Medicaid, which means that if they are successful, they will aim at Social Security and Medicare. The good thing is if they aim at Social Security and Medicare, they will affect, be affecting 70 million white Americans. I don't think that they will agree with it. And I think that, uh, that that is it. We can also watch the upcoming <coughs> Roe versus Wade arguments in the Supreme Court to see where it goes, because I just cannot wait to see the police unloose dogs and tear gas and horse uh, uh, born riders to beat up groups of women marching in the United States. <laughs> this might do it. But I want to go back uh, further. Uh, to uh, the excitement of the Civil War. There are several things that, that come to mind and we must never forget. And that is the Civil War was fought over slavery. That's right. That was the cause. That's right. I remember a student of mine said, no, it was fought about railroads and property and so <laughs> forth. And I said, in other words, somebody couldn't get a ticket to on the train and they started the Civil War. <laughs> and he said, no, but it was fought over slavery. You will hear things like the, the, the war was fought to uh, preserve the Union or to cease divisions in the Union. But what was it that was dividing That's the right. Union? That's right. The fact that the uh, Northern states had decided that slavery must go on and Southern, I must end, and Southern states decided that it should go on. And as we always do in America, we never really confront issues dead on. Mm -hmm. We always come up with things. So now, um, the war was not about slavery. It was about uh, extending it into the free territories. Mm -hmm. And that was an argument that is very, very popular. Uh, and in the, into this comes the reality that the country went into civil war because Abraham Lincoln was elected president. And Abraham Lincoln was no friend of slavery at all. Uh, he had campaigned on a platform of not letting it go into the territories. Mm -hmm. But the South was wise enough to know that once you strangled the institution and kept it from growing, that that was just the beginning of ending it. And of course, he said he would not interfere with slavery where it was. But the Southerners did not believe him. That's right. And they turned out to be right. Uh, what were Lincoln's feelings about slavery? They're not too hard to discern. He had been talking for uh, seven, eight years before he was elected to the presidency. And in those, those times, he never said one word that would indicate that he favored it. Mm -hmm. That's right. Everything that he said indicated that he hated it and that he disliked it. Mm -hmm. And I think one of his best addresses was the House Divided Address when he said a house divided against itself cannot stand. Uh, this nation cannot exist permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the nation to be divided, but it can be divided. But I do expect that it will be together. It will be all th one thing or another. Either the people who want to extend slavery will make it so that it is legal north as well as south, or it will be ended so it's not legal anyway. I always thought that was his most important address because two years later he became president of the United States. And everything that he did was regarding slavery. We often look at documents and statements as something right out of the clear air as separate 
from what was really going on. We take them out of the context and we build whole cases uh, uh, around them. Um, and this has been the case quite often with Abraham Lincoln. And you have to understand that until 1888, Abraham Lincoln was considered the great emancipator. Mm -hmm. He was a hero. There were statues being, all, being uh, built all over the country honoring Abel, not the South, honoring Abraham Lincoln for his emancipation of the Negro population. But after 1888, the American history books were written, and most of them were written by Southern people. And these history books were sent all over the United States and put in classrooms. And we find that quite often what the authors were doing was trying to protect the South from criticism and indeed to change it altogether. When I uh, changed history altogether, when I was taking uh, uh, North Carolina history when I was uh, 13 years old, and I can still remember that, that was a part of the textbook that pointed out that slavery had absolutely nothing to do with the Civil War whatsoever. <laughs> and I had found over the next decades that that's been a rather prevalent view among people that slavery really did, the, the war would have come without it. And of course, it's absolutely imaginable. <laughs> and historians are placed at a disadvantage. We cannot tell you what would have happened or would or should have happened. We can only tell you what happened. And the war was fought because Lincoln was elected president and the South left the Union. It should also be pointed out to those of you who are new at studying the Civil War that the secession of the South did not come as a surprise. That's right. The South had been stating during the entire election that it would not be governed by Abraham Lincoln. And uh, Senator Stephen Douglas, who was running against Lincoln, broke all kinds of precedent by going out actually campaigning. Because up until 1860, the office of president was of such dignity that the president himself never campaigned for it. He stayed at home and other people did the work for him. But Senator Douglas realized that with three Democrats running against one Republican, that he'd better get out and distinguish himself. So he actually went south. And he went into uh, 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 slave areas, and he read newspapers, and he talked to people. And when he came back during the campaign, he was absolutely horrified because he knew that if Lincoln were elected president, the southern states would leave the Union. They said they were going to do it. Abraham Lincoln won the presidency, and the southern states left the Union. Mm -hmm. uh, we must never forget how marvelous Lincoln's political instincts were. He did not run as an abolitionist. That's right. Never. He ran as a patriot, insisting that his opposition was not to slavery, but to extending it into the territory. He said that uh, Justice Roger Taney and the Supreme Court that had ruled that slavery could go into the territories were in error. And he ran on the platform that he would not allow slavery to extend into any free territories from the uh, Appalachian Mountains uh, to the Pacific Ocean, which we had by the time he was president. Uh, he told the South he wouldn't bother slavery where it was, mm -hmm. but that he would not allow it to expand. That being the case, and because of the disarray of the Democratic Party, Lincoln was able to win the election with only 40% of the popular vote. However, like in 2016, <laughs> uh, the president won because he had the majority of the Electoral College. The difference, though, of course, is that Lincoln did have more votes than anyone else. <laughs> it wasn't a situation where uh, Lincoln was, was proclaimed president and three million more people voted for the other guy than voted for him. <laughs> that was simply not the case. So, and unfortunately for us right now, one of the big problems that the present Republican administration has is the fact that any way you look at it, the population did not give him a mandate, it voted for the other guy. Mm -hmm. So when he says, I've got a mandate to do this, that, and the other, the answer is no, don't, because most people did not vote for you. Mm -hmm. And this will, if the Democrats play it right, wreak havoc upon much of what he wants to do.
because the large majority of people in the country did not want Donald Trump and will not support him if the demonstrations can continue, which I expect they will because it's going to get warm after a while. Right. And that really brings people out to them. Right. Um, uh, Lincoln, like everybody else, expected that the Civil War would end in 90 days. And if you look at it, he had good reasons for thinking that. In the first place, the South had only one third of the population that the North had. And the second thing was there was not a single munitions factory in the entirety of the Southern states. So they would have to get their guns from somewhere and their, their uh, uh, war material from someplace else. Um, so why did the war not last? Uh, not end three months after it started, as was predicted. And there are two reasons for it. The most important one was that there was not a single officer in the armed forces of the Union above the rank of lieutenant colonel who was not a slaveholder. Mm -hmm. So the entirety of the North of, of the Army and Navy and uh, Coast Guard and Marine hierarchy were slaveholders. Nobody expected that these people would renounce their oaths of allegiance to the United States and go someplace else, which they did <laughs> in large numbers. So when the war started, the South may not have had everything it needed. It needed it never did. But what it did have was the military uh, strategies the people who knew what they were doing. It's interesting, if they hadn't had Robert E. Lee, the South might have been able to end the war. But they had Robert E. Lee, who was a very poor general. Although we've heard he was the greatest thing in the world. But in reality, if you don't fight a war to win it, you will probably lose it. And Lee's strategy was to not lose the war. And consequently, he did not invade the North until it was far too late, and he met his end at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. But had he been more aggressive earlier, he might very well have done much more damage to Union cities than he was able to do, and who knows what would have happened. But again, you had Lee as the general, and you also had uh, all of the American generals and admirals who were uh, with the South. And so the, the cream had to rise to the top. That is General Meade, General Grant, General Sherman, because they certainly weren't there at the beginning of the war. Yeah. But as things proceeded, they rose, mm -hmm. though not without difficulty. Grant tended to drink too much <laughs> and was quite often drunk. <laughs> and possibly it was because he was drunk that he fought as well as he did, because he would never yield. So he had very high casualties, but the South had even higher casualties than he did. So of course there was a big movement in Washington to get him out. I mean, after all, he's drunk, and you don't need a drunk commanding soldiers. And Lincoln took the position, because he was to a great extent like President Obama would be, very calm, he never got rattled. And he said, find out what he drinks and send a case of it to all of my other generals, because maybe they would. Uh, the, 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 the problem that arose from the, arose from the beginning of the Civil War, which Lincoln finally resolved, and we, we don't want to get away from that, is as you know, the slaves could not read and write. So they couldn't read the newspapers, and they didn't know all the arguments that, was, that were going on because they couldn't read and write. They did, however, in their gut, know one thing. And that thing that they knew in their gut was that the war was being fought over them. And the war was being fought over slavery. And consequently, they started running away in much larger numbers than they had run away uh, since the Revolutionary War. That's right. As some of you know, at the time of the Revolutionary War, one out of every four Americans was an African slave. And 125,000 of them ran away in the chaos of, of the American Revolution. They left the United States and they went to British territory in the north. 
and that's where they were safe and so forth until after the war ended and the British gave that territory to the United States whereupon the Africans discovered they were once again back in the United States and that territory of course was the Northwest Territory. A similar occurrence happened with the Mormons much later on when they left the United States and went to the Mexican province of Utah where they would be safe from American persecution but then right after they got there uh, America defeated Mexico and Utah became a part of the Western Territory <laughs> and the Mormons found themselves right back in the Union. And of course they had to give up polygamy as a result, which a lot of you don't object to. <laughs> that is, they're giving it up. <laughs> so, so those are things that happened. But the, the, the slaves started to, uh, to leave. And they left in large numbers. And where did they go? Well, first of all, anywhere they could. <laughs> but the second thing was an awful lot of the South's manpower had left the plantations and gone into the wards. Not the rich people, but the overseers and drivers had left to go into the war. So there was less supervision of slaves than there had been, especially those in the upper South. And as the Union armies fought, the slaveholders saw their, their people running away to the Union armies. This caused a tremendous problem. The first thing was so many of them were running and they were indeed pathetic people. <laughs> they had nothing. Some of them had infant children. An awful lot of them were sick. They all needed to eat and drink. And a moving army normally is moving to to fight, it just doesn't have time for large numbers of dependent people. So the issue arose as to what do we do with these people? And what happened to the slaves that ran into Union lines really depended on the officer who was there. Some officers fought for the Union, but they were sympathetic to slavery. Others didn't care about slavery much. They were just fighting to keep the Union together. And some were outright abolitionists. And some opposed slavery, but they weren't for integration. So basically what happened to the slaves that got there was either they stayed or either they got sent back or what have you, but they kept coming. The South passed more laws to keep them, as you might understand, but they kept coming and running away because they knew that this war was being fought over slavery. We went to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln came to prominence right after the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and that was the act that said that in the Louisiana Territory, Kansas would be able to decide whether it wanted to be free or slave. The problem here was that the Missouri Compromise was about the Louisiana Territory and had ruled that there would be no slavery north of the southern boundary of uh, Missouri. Kansas is north of that southern boundary of Missouri. And the, the, the issue that strikes and that tore Lincoln to bit was that America then, as now, does not have enough people. We have a huge land, but we don't have enough people in it. I know we have enough in Detroit and New York and Washington, but they're not really the American heartland or the American farmland. So consequently, we have always needed to bring in people. As a result of all of our wars between the uh, Revolutionary War and the Mexican War, America had, had, had gained an awful lot of territory. Because most Americans didn't live much farther from the Atlantic Ocean than about 50 miles at the time of the Revolution. So you had to fill out ultimately 2,900 miles of space with people. And the only way you could get these people was by recruiting them from Europe. So America passed the Northwest Ordinance, which was a recruiting tool to get Europeans to come over. They were white, they were farmers, they needed help, and this would be a good way to get them. And so they passed the Northwest Ordinance. Obviously, Africans would not be a part of it because uh, no one wanted them. And the second thing was that Indians could not be a part of it because 
uh, whites and Indians did not get along well, and whenever you had large groups of Indians around whites, they died of various diseases, so they would not be allies. It was the Europeans that the country wanted. So it had begun to import them in enormous numbers. So that in uh, uh, 1776, there were 3 million people in the country, but by 1860, there were 35 million people in the country. So the, the population had gone up a thousand times, and that was because Europeans were invited to come over. They came over because all of these lands allowed them to work and compete with themselves, but they didn't have to compete with, 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 with slave labor. Mm -hmm. So therefore, people who were plumbers and people who were hairdryers and uh, hairdressers and people that were barbers could go and set up business and not have to compete with Jake, who you got from, uh, uh, from somebody's farm who owned Jake, and you didn't have to pay Jake. Mm -hmm. So this was wonderful, but with the West being open to slavery, it meant that the United States would no longer be able to recruit Europeans to come over. That's right. And Lincoln saw that as just a catastrophe in terms of the growth of the United States to the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. And that's why he began to campaign and to make speeches. He was unique in his day because there was an understanding in Lincoln's day in the 50s that there was to be no discussion about slavery in political speeches. That's right. I love that. Uh, it was the issue that was tearing the country apart, but no one could talk about it, and basically people did. Mm -hmm. But then they started talking about slavery in the territories, and then they could talk about that. But when Lincoln started speaking, that's all he ever talked about. <laughs> slavery and nothing else. That's all. And he wrote about it. And his debates with Stephen Douglas were published and went everywhere. Mm -hmm. And finally, he was such an outstanding spokesman on the subject that he was invited to come to New York City to make a speech. <laughs> and that was unheard of. This country hit coming to New York City to make a speech. And of course, that turned out to be his Cooper Union address, which was actually the beginning of the notoriety, which led him to the presidency. So he becomes president. In those days, you were elected in November and you took over in, in April. So you had four, four months. Now, originally that wasn't a bad idea because in the early days, there weren't any roads and highways and it took you four months to get from wherever you were elected to get to Washington. You would be interested in knowing that uh, this four month period stayed until uh, 1930, when, when, when Franklin Roosevelt was elected president. Mm -hmm. And that's when they, they, they cut it from four months to the present, two months. So Lincoln was elected president, and while he was elected, he saw the Union completely come mm -hmm. apart. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing that he could do. Mm -hmm. President Buchanan would do nothing on the grounds that he didn't think the South should leave, mm -hmm. but he also didn't think he had the authority to do anything about it. What he was actually doing was biding his time. And when Lincoln got to Washington and went to the White House, they had a ceremony where the outgoing president met the incoming president and they shook hands, said a few things. And when Lincoln got to the door, President Buchanan rushed out and he said, sir, if you are as happy entering this house as I am leaving it, you are indeed a happy man. <laughs> so Buchanan left. Now, uh, Lincoln had no no doubts about what he had to do. And he made a marvelous address six times before he left uh, Springfield, uh, Illinois to get to, uh, to Washington. And here it is, it's called the Farewell Address. And he says, friends, no one who has never been placed in like position can understand my feelings at this hour, nor the oppressive sadness I feel at this party. For more than a quarter of a century I have lived among you, and during all that time I have received nothing but kindness at your hands. Here I have lived from my youth until now I am an old man. 51. Here my most cherished ties of earth were assumed. Here all my children were born, and here one of them lies buried. To you, dear friends, I owe all that I have, all that I am. All the strange checkered past seems to 
crowd now upon my mind. Today I leave you. I go to assume a task more difficult than that which devolved upon Washington. And that, of course, lets us know how serious he thought this thing was. Mm -hmm. Unless the great God who assisted him shall be with and aid me, I must fail. But if that same omniscient mind and mighty arm that directed and protected Washington shall guide and support, let us all pray that the God of our fathers may not forsake us now. To him I commend you all. Permit me to ask that with equal sincerity and faith, you will invoke his wisdom and guidance for me. With these words, I must leave you. For how long, I know not. Friends, one and all, I must now bid you an affectionate farewell. And here, Mrs. Lincoln got on the train and took off, and they went to, uh, to Washington. Things were tense, and uh, uh, while Lincoln was coming into Washington, seven states had left the Union. There were still eight slave states that had not. So Lincoln hoped very much that he could talk the seven slave states into coming back into the Union. Um, but he was very concerned that while he was getting ready for his inaugural address and so forth, that there were Southern diplomats in Washington trying to negotiate with Congress and high members of the government to allow the South to leave the Union mm -hmm. and uh, not stop them. Mm -hmm. And Lincoln was always appalled that they would do it and appalled that there were people who would listen to it. Um, when he got into office, there were so many appointments that he had made. Plus, he had a cabinet that didn't think he knew very much. Uh, they hadn't wanted him, and several people had run against him for president that year. Uh, and the, another problem he had was his accent, which he never really got over. Uh, he never had any formal education, about, about three months of it. Mm -hmm. And he, taught, he was born in a, a log cabin and so forth, and he hadn't gone to Harvard and Yale like everybody else. One of the things that shocked everybody when he got to the Cooper Union Address was that when he got ready to thank the chairman who brought him, he said, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you. And everybody said, oh my God. Mm -hmm. But by the end of the address, he had people uh, on their feet because it was such a magnificent speech. But there were still a lot of people that didn't think much of it. The second thing is that many of the cabinet members had looked at the fact that they were cabinet members, and this meant that actually they could run the country and just get him to sign things, <laughs> and that would be all right. Uh, but Lincoln, on the other hand, knew he was just as smart as any in all of them. After all, they'd been in Washington when the collapse took place, so therefore, uh, they had some things to answer for. And he was never rude, uh, but, uh, um, and he tended to cooperate except when they disagreed with him. <laughs> so, uh, Fort Sumter was fired upon by the slaveholding government. And the cabinet got together and they decided basically not to do anything. Let's just wait. That was not the first southern fort to be taken. And um, it would probably not be the last, but they didn't want to provoke anything. That was a good idea, except Lincoln had always known that the American government is not cabinet, as is the British parliamentary government. Mm -hmm. The American government is the executive, is presidential which means people who are members of the cabinet are bound to do what the president wants. Mm -hmm. So Lincoln said that he had no intentions of interfering with anything. However, there had been a request for food, supplies, medicine, and pay. And he was sending an unarmed ship down into the Charleston Harbor to relieve Fort Sumter. And of course, he let it be known. And they had to telegraph so all the newspapers knew that the president had decided that he was going to send an unarmed ship down there to rescue the fort. The South, of course, was outraged by it because they knew what that meant, but they fell into the trap and mm -hmm. fired on the fort anyway. Mm -hmm. The fort surrendered, Major Walker and his, uh, his troops left, and the war was on. Lincoln then asked for 75,000 troops, and in those days, the president couldn't draft. He could go to the states and ask for troops. 
So Lincoln asked the other states, the other 26 of them, if they would send him 75,000 troops. And after nine, nine weeks, he had 15,000 because nobody was going to send troops. Not to mention the fact that Arkansas, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Kentucky had asked to be exempted from sending, uh, from, from participating in any conflict that was going to take place. And they wanted to declare neutrality so they could stay out of it. Cabinet was prepared to accept that, but President Lincoln would not. His point was that a state cannot leave the Union. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the states have not left the Union. Mm -hmm. That there were rebellions against the central authority going on in those states, but that those states were still a part of the Union because, as he said, once the state comes into the Union, it is the Union. Mm -hmm. So you can't get out of it. And this argument was what carried him through the four years of this gutter war. And of course, when he said he would not accept neutrality, then Virginia, North Carolina, and Tennessee, and Arkansas then joined the state, the uh, other slave holding uh, rebel states. And he had 11 states that he had to deal with. There were also problems in Maryland because the governor of Maryland really wanted Maryland to secede too. And if it did, then of course, uh, the capital would be surrounded by two state right. slave states right. pledging allegiance to another country. Mm -hmm. So Lincoln then, instead of trying to be reasonable, invaded Baltimore and arrested the governor and several members of the state legislature and put them in jail. <laughs> when they were asked what the charge was, he said he didn't know yet, but you they had to stay in jail. Yeah. And when the Supreme Court told him he couldn't do that, since it was uh, Judge Tawney, he didn't respect it anyway, and so therefore he paid little attention to it. And ultimately, the uh, legislature of Maryland advised him that under no circumstances would it secede. And so therefore he didn't have to worry about it, and with that he had a train going to pick up the governor and the people that he'd arrested and took them into the Confederacy and dropped them off there if that's where they wanted to stay. I'm sorry, ma'am. <laughs> and so that was that. Oh, the protest of what he did was just unbelievable. I think comparable to him in our time has been when this um, American trader um, left and went to Yemen and was advising terrorist groups in the United States and terrorist people how to commit acts of terrorism, which led to the shooting in Houston of uh, an enlisted men's cafeteria. And of course, the guy was knocked out in a drone strike. Mm -hmm. And ever since that time, people have been saying it's outrageous for America to have blown up one of its citizens overseas. They should really have gone and extricated him. And of course, I always had two responses for that. The first thing is, where are these people when all the black kids get shot? Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, how many American soldiers did you want to die in the process of getting this one guy out? Mm -hmm. And so that was that. But anyway, everybody had a fit about how he had treated the um, uh, governor of Maryland, even though most people were not sympathetic to the governor of Maryland. And Lincoln went on. Uh, when the war finally got going good, uh, as most of you know who are civil, civil, wise, uh, civil War followers, the first battle of Bull Run was um, quite a thing. And since the North knew it was going to win, and it was close to Washington, then people poured out of Washington to get there so they could watch the battle. And of course they brought their picnic lunches and so forth so they could watch. And they also had many hawkers there selling things. It was a fair. And everybody was there. And then the battle started and the, the North found the troops not retreating but being routed and running as far away as they could from all that noise and from the battle. And it was a serious thought that that general of, uh, of the uh, Confederate forces might actually have been able to push to Washington, but he elected not to do it. Mm -hmm. At any rate, that sort of uh, made everybody, including the president, you know, think, what is this mess that I'm in? Uh, the war was still going on, and, and 
and Lincoln was getting some troops, but there were still problems about why are we fighting this war? What is the cause of the war? And of course, many people concluded that the cause of the war was slavery. Mm -hmm. And Lincoln always maintained that the cause of the war was the division of the Union, mm -hmm. that the reason we were fighting was to reunite the Union. But there were still those people who thought that the cause of the war was slavery, and if that were the case, they were not going to participate in it. That's right. And that's where we have the famous interview or response to a letter by Horace Greeley, editor of a New York newspaper, who asked the President, frankly, is this war being fought about slavery? Well, at this point, uh, when Lincoln gets this letter, he decides to respond to it, but he also knows that his position is not really very secure. Mm -hmm. This war is going on, and folks, we have won anything. Mm -hmm. Every time we've gone against the South, they've beaten us. And why? Because they had the generals. Mm -hmm. And generals know how to fight. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. So consequently, Lincoln sent back a very carefully worded answer, which, if you think about it, is like uh, Sean Spicer's poet gibberish. <laughs> what he said was, uh, this war is being fought to preserve the Union. Uh, if I could preserve the Union and free none of the slaves, that's what I would do. If I could preserve the Union by freeing half the slaves and leaving the others in slavery, I would do that. If I could uh, preserve the Union by freeing all the slaves, uh, I would do that. But I will preserve the Union. And so what he was saying was, Nothing. He said, I, you know, slavery is not the issue. That's not why we're fighting. And then he mentions it continually in explaining why it's not <laughs> what we're fighting about. So that satisfied people, except in 150 years, I find that statement's being taken out of context uh, as if it existed in a vacuum. And people are saying, well, Lincoln didn't really fight over slavery. He was fighting to preserve the Union, etc., etc. But those people who say that always forget what it was that had divided the Union in the first place, mm -hmm. namely slavery. Mm -hmm. um, Lincoln then decided, you know, shortly after the first battle of Bull Run, or Antietam as it's called, <coughs> that he was going to issue an Emancipation Proclamation and free all the slaves. Now, the reason he was going to do this was that he was just as concerned as, 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 as I have been over how a country with no munitions factories could be holding off a great army. What is this all about? And of course, what he concluded, quite rightly, was that in the case of the, of the South, all their troops did was fight. That's all. They didn't have to cook. They didn't have to be nursing. They didn't have to clean the latrines. They didn't have to clean the rifles. How's all that being done? The slaves did. The slaves did. So as long as the South had all these slaves, it had nothing to worry about. It had really augmented its forces. Whereas the Union armies themselves had to do all of that. They had to eat their own cooking, which must have been ghastly. I was in the army in 71, <laughs> and I don't think things changed that much. But they had to eat their own cooking, and they had to clean their own rifles, and they had to clean their own latrines. And an awful lot of people are not involved in soldiers, not involved in fighting. They were involved in support. The, the Southerners didn't have that. They had slaves doing it. And so Lincoln thought about maybe if he got rid of slavery, that would really handicap the South. Um, it's interesting that uh, at this point Frederick Douglass had begun to petition the president and hound him about the fact that there were no Negroes in the army. And what Douglass wanted was to uh, get Lincoln to put freedmen into the army or even slaves because once he did that, then of course uh, the Union's forces would be augmented. But Lincoln wasn't a fool. He knew exactly what Douglas was doing, which was persuading him to put slaves in the army. Because once slaves were in the army, 
there was a real uh, implication that Africans might actually, in reality, be what? Citizens. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, only citizens are privileged to fight in the army. So Lincoln wouldn't do it. He didn't promise Douglas that he would uh, uh, make him a lieutenant <laughs> and send him down to the south, but he never did. It didn't help relations between him and Douglas at all, but, but he did. When Lincoln presented the emancipation to the proclamation, the proclamation to his cabinet, the cabinet had a fit. They went into riot. Even the abolitionists uh, uh, argued against it because this, this, this was just too fast. This was just too much. Nobody would go along with it. And in all of this chaos, Secretary Seward said, you know, the real problem, Mr. President, is that we haven't won any battles. And since we haven't won any battles, if you issue a thing like this, people would think you're grandstanding. So don't do it. Lincoln, bitterly disappointed, picked up his Emancipation Proclamation and went to wait because he knew he wasn't going to get any support from it, from the cabinet whatsoever. Meantime, Lincoln was concerned about the slaves, and he was concerned about what their fate was going to be. And even if they were freed, the question is what was going to happen to them. So Lincoln did something absolutely unprecedented in American history. He called a meeting of colored leaders. And never had anything like this happened since we got off the boat in 1619. Mm -hmm. And so uh, many of the leaders then came to uh, meet with the president in Washington at the White House. Conspicuously absent, of course, was Frederick Douglass. So at that point, Lincoln then told them that uh, we were actually, but it wasn't our fault, the cause of this war. And what he wanted was to think about after the war, and he asked the colored leaders if they would agree to a repatriation program, mm -hmm. whereby the four million Africans in the country would be repatriated to some other place. To his incredible surprise, they had a fit in that. Mm -hmm. They told him no, that we'd been here from the beginning, even before the, the Mayflower, that we had fought in all the country's wars. This was as much in our country as any, any other, and we weren't going to leave. Lincoln left. He, he couldn't believe that they actually had said they would want to stay here when he was offering them a way out. But I look back at it, and I say, well, this was really the first time he'd ever met any Negroes. Because mm. <laughs> he wouldn't have had, you know, except the slaves that were watching him, he wouldn't have had any occasion to meet any. And so he never had asked any Negroes what they thought. And when he did, he got the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of that. And they all left rather disillusioned, except Frederick Douglass, who didn't go and never thought he would say anything else anyway. So finally, we won the second battle of uh, Manassas. And at that point, Lincoln realizes that he can now issue the Emancipation Proclamation. He's very worried that England may come into the war because our war and the uh, had, had uh, destroyed Britain's textile uh, in, uh, industry because it, it depended on, on uh, cotton being brought in from the south to England. So England was seriously thinking about getting into the war, as was France. Mm -hmm. But Lincoln also had become very confident. It's true we hadn't won the war, but we hadn't lost it either. And our armies were going larger and larger as time was going on. And the munitions factories were making all kinds of guns and weapons and bullets. I mean, some of them all. Plus, the machine gun was being invented and was actually being practiced uh, in the war. So Lincoln made it very clear to the British that if they got into the war on the side of the South, that he would take Canada. <laughs> and he would because we've always wanted Canada. That was a part of Manifest Destiny. And the English realized they would have to bring their ships 3,000 miles over here to fight and so forth. And, and they elected not to do it. So Lincoln um, issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, quite often, and even last night when I was working, was, was finalizing this thing, uh, I read that the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free any slaves. 
And I thought to myself, the guy that wrote that never read the thing. And then I read that the reason it didn't free any slaves was that the only slaves it freed were those that were in the uh, uh, Confederate South and they were not the slaves that Lincoln had any control of. And that sounds pretty good if you don't investigate. And as historians, you know, you always have to investigate when you hear something ridiculous or when you hear something that doesn't go along with what you've always heard. You see, it is true that we all remember the Emancipation Proclamation for basically what it said, which was it, it emancipated all the slaves uh, and made them free. But Lincoln wasn't a fool. And there are actually three parts to the Emancipation Proclamation. We only know one, and people who say it didn't do anything are taking advantage of the fact that you haven't read it either. The first part of it says the slaves are free everywhere. But the second part is very important because the second part says once slaves run away, and by this time they were really running away, and land inside of northern armies that are invading, those slaves are instantly free. Furthermore, commanders are forbidden to return them to their former owners. The set, third thing was, it says that the slaves who are there can It says that such, I further declare that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed services of the United States, the garrison fort positions, stations and other places to man, uh, man vessels. And in all cases when they can, they shall be allowed to work for wages. So what this means then is not only did Lincoln free the slaves, but he told them how to get free. And he told everybody what would constitute freedom and what would happen to them afterwards. So when people say it didn't free anybody, uh, they assume you don't know that the northern forces were invading the south, and they assume that you don't know that the slaves were running into the northern lines as soon as they got there, and that the slaves were free just as soon as they did get there. About 1.3 million slaves received their freedom during the war by running into the uh, <laughs> Union lines. That's right. The Emancipation Proclamation itself is not one of those brilliant documents. I mean, he didn't even, he didn't even um, uh, begin it with a speech or something like that. If you, and Frederick Douglass hated it. And the reason he hated it was because it was an issue in September of, of, of 1862, and it says if the South doesn't stop fighting, mm -hmm. then of course I'll, enter, I'll issue the Emancipation Proclamation, which meant that if they did stop fighting, <coughs> then all the slaves would stay slaves. <laughs> and Douglas was appalled. Mm -hmm. Of course, the South didn't stop fighting. There was no reason for it too, because it, it, it hadn't lost. Um, but it was beginning to suffer. And, and with the Emancipation Proclamation, literally in the South, all hell broke loose. Mm -hmm. As Southerners condemned the thing, the slaves heard it. Mm -hmm. And they started running away all over the place. And when the slaves ran away, mm -hmm. what that meant was there was no one to do what? Grow mm -hmm. food. Grow right. food. Mm -hmm. And for the rest of the war after the Emancipation Proclamation, Whenever food was grown and produced, where did it go? To the army. Which meant if you happen to be living in Birmingham, Alabama, and you got hungry, what did you do? Well, you right, because there was no way to get food otherwise, and uh, because all the food had to go uh, to the north. Um, <clears throat> the war was still going on. And Lincoln, uh, uh, Lee made his one chance to go north, uh, and he invaded uh, Pennsylvania, and he planned to move his armies east and take Baltimore. 
there were so many problems with regards to the Emancipation Proclamation and the North was dissolving and people were calling for Lincoln's head. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, he was in a lot of trouble and almost lost control of the House of Representatives in the November election. Okay. But um, the Gettysburg battle was fought and 30,000 people were killed in that battle. It was decided to make that a national park because the bodies had decomposed so much that you couldn't bring them all back. So they did. And this is when Lincoln makes his definitive statement about what's going on. Uh, the initial address by Reverend Edward Everett, who was the best orator in America, lasted um, uh, two hours in 105 degree weather. Mm. Uh, Lincoln's lasted two minutes and 36 seconds. Right. And we've never forgotten that. <laughs> and in that address, he says, four score and seven years ago, that's 1776, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Um, but of course, all men weren't created equal if they lived in the United States. We still had a large number of people who were enslaved. He says, now we're engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any other nation so conceived and so dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal can long endure. We met on a great battlefield of that war. We've come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place to those who here gave their lives that the nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. He stopped. And then unlike you all, everyone applauded. <laughs> but in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our full power to add or to detract. <laughs> the world will little note, no longer remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is rather for us the living to be dedicated to the unfinished work which they fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave their last full measure of devotion, that we hear how resolved that these dead shall not have died in vain and that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. Mm -hmm. And what does he mean by a new birth of freedom? Ending slavery. That slavery will be ended. In other words, what is this war about? Slavery. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen at the end of this war? Slavery will be ended. Uh, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation was, quite frankly, a magnificent document. It's the best thing that happened since 1808 when Congress outlawed the, 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 the importation of Africans. However, there were large areas in the country that were exempted from the Emancipation Proclamation because the Emancipation Proclamation only covered those areas where the people were in rebellion, as he put it. That's right. And uh, he, he knew that because of the, the, um, the fact that the South senators and congressmen had already left the, uh, their offices and had uh, taken positions in the rebel government, except for one person who didn't leave. Anybody know who it was who kept his seat? A senator from Tennessee. Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson. <laughs> he kept his seat. And he was to become vice president and president, oh Lord. But that was that, because he was a former slaveholder and he tried everything he did quite successfully to undo everything that Lincoln had done during the war. It took us a hundred years to undo the damage that, that Andrew Johnson did to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you know somebody who was a mass murderer, or somebody who was a mass rapist and so forth, that you know is going to hell, I'm um, be sure to greet Andrew when he gets <laughs> <laughs> uh, <but laughs> here. 
so many areas that were exempted from the Emancipation Proclamation. That was the whole state of Kentucky, which had slaves but did not leave. Mm -hmm. That was Maryland and Delaware, which had slaves and didn't leave. Mm -hmm. That was Missouri. That was the District of Columbia. And there were the 41 wow. counties of Virginia in the West, mm -hmm. which were called West Virginia, that did not secede. And of course, the slaves in the district. There were about a million of them who would not be covered. Not to mention the fact there were an awful lot of slaves in the South that didn't run away. Mm -hmm. So Lincoln knew that he was going to be defeated in uh, November in the 1964 election. There's no way he win. So that the country might fight, but it wouldn't be over that. And that's when he came up with the idea of amending the Constitution. Now, I assume that everybody in the room, and I'm being very pro professorial here, has seen Lincoln. Because if you haven't, go see it. Because it explains to you what the president really has to do to get something done. And you all remember how hard it was for President Obama to get the Affordable Health Care Act passed. The fact that the thing is as complicated as it is has to do with all the various elements that he had to satisfy just to get the thing through. And Lincoln had to do the same thing because the process is that two-thirds of the House and Senate have to vote on the amendment and then they send it to three-fourths of the states, and send it to the states, three-fourths of which have to adopt it. The amendment was simple. It said that neither slavery or involuntary servitude except for commission of crime shall exist here. Lincoln didn't anticipate what they would do with the except as uh, uh, involuntary servitude. We can't blame him for that because he was dead. But uh, it was a good amendment. Uh, the problem was that he couldn't get it out of Congress. And one thing I was sorry about the movie uh, it didn't talk about the meeting that Lincoln had with the congressmen like it should have. Because what he told those congressmen who were holdouts, bluntly, was, if you don't sign this, I'm not going to do anything for you while you're in Congress. And you can't function with me as president because I can stop bills from being passed or I can support the bills that you want. I found out all kinds of things since I've been president. <laughs> and when these people left, they eventually voted for the emancipation for the 13th Amendment, and it went to the state, to the states. Problem was, going to the states, there were 35 states, and you needed two-thirds of those states, which was 23, in order to pass it. And you didn't have them. That's right. Because 15 of the 23 states that you needed fighting. were slave states. <laughs> right. And they would never let this thing go. So how did you do it? Well, Lincoln then had learned a lot since he was president. And what he said was there were 11 states where there was a big rebellion going on against the Union. Mm -hmm. So you obviously couldn't consider them as part of the Union because they had left it. So instead of having 34, you had 34 minus 11 which left you with 23. So what you needed then was three-fourths of 23, which is about 16 or 17. And he had those. And so the amendment passed, the understanding being that in order to come back into the Union, the southern states had to agree to accept it. And all of them did, except Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And that was how he did it. And that meant that slaves everywhere were freed. And then Lincoln was re-elected president because of the Battle of Vicksburg and the uh, destruction of Atlanta. And he was assassinated a month after he was inaugurated the second time. But he was a great president, a great man, because a great man is someone who does the impossible. And what he did was to free the slaves, which was impossible. It's just like Martin Luther King leading our social movement in the 50s and, and, and 60s. He did what was impossible, which was to end segregation in the United States. He did it. And so he is a great man. So we salute permanently Lincoln for everything that he did, waging the war, refusing to end the war without his victory, freeing the slaves, and enshrining their freedom in the 13th Amendment. He was a great man. Even Frederick Douglass went on to admit it. 
that he wasn't as bad as he thought he was. Mm -hmm. And that was that. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> and I'm so glad you came.